Hello, everybody. My name is Luke Nathan Phillips. Uh, I uh, have been running the uh, America's Public Forum event series uh, over the course of the last year. And uh, you are all joining us for the kind of uh, soft, unofficial relaunch of the America's Public Forum uh, for the, uh, the broader event trends that Brave Angels is working to put on nationally for the year of 2021 into 2022. So welcome and uh, looking forward to, uh, to seeing you at these uh, uh, when we put them on um, weekly over the course of the next many months. Uh, the America's Public Forum series, for those of you who have not been to one of these yet, is uh, one of Braver Angels' new flagship uh, programs, and it's a way to bring, um, bring, uh, bring, bring the spirit of depolarization and the spirit of discourse that we do uh, in, uh, in Braver Angels in, um, in, our, in our civic workshops and our debates and our other kinds of events and bring it to a, uh, a, uh, an even larger audience uh, and also incorporate people who have uh, been, been, uh, been, been dedicating a lot of their lives and work to, uh, to studying a lot of these, uh, these deeper ideas um, that sometimes are directly related to depolarization and sometimes are just related to the polarized issues that we Americans are facing. But um, it's been a, a fascinating way to explore some of these things and I've been quite honored to be working with a bunch of wonderful people on that. So, uh, so welcome to America's Public Forum. You'll be hearing about more of these events coming up in the coming weeks and I'll tell you more about those at the end of this meeting. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to John Wood Jr., my dear friend and the MC for this evening. John, it's all yours. Hey, thank you very much, Luke. And uh, thank you to all of you for, for being here. Uh, it's, it's been uh, several months and many haircuts since the last time I joined an America's Public Forum event. So I'm happy to be able to do so and happy to be able to do so alongside my good friends, Lexi, uh, Lexi Hudson and uh, Bill Doherty in order to talk about the subject of friendship itself, right? And so uh, I guess I'll just sort of contextualize our conversation this way and uh, then sort of Turn us, turn us loose and see what ground we wind up uh, trotting upon. Um, you know, friendship is an interesting subject in the context of certainly our work at Braver Angels in this moment we are in as a country. I, I think that when Braver Angels first began as an organization, back when we were still better angels and when we were just starting to, uh, uh, just, just starting to sort of touch the moral imagination of, of some of the American people, um, the idea of bringing people together across their differences to have good faith conversations and to develop empathy with one another was something that seemed like a nice idea, but it was important, I think, for us um, in the early stages, as it is now, to, to remind people of the fact that the work that we do, while it is deeply fulfilling and while it opens up the avenue for us to develop connections with people with whom we might not otherwise expect to have them, given the toxicity of the current landscape, that this work was not just about positive experiences, but that these experiences and this relationship building was itself important. Of American society and of our political culture, our civic society, etc. And that claim is something that has been important in the context of our being able to make the case that our work is about more than just, you know, more than just feeling good, more, more than just sort of, you know, singing kumbaya and so forth. Our work, ha work has to do with the nitty gritty activity of preserving the health of the greatest the greatest democratic uh, society in the history of the world. And yet, I think that it is fair to say that without the possibility, without the potential of friendship as being a good that emerges between people who maybe have many things in common and people who have perhaps even relatively few things in common, but who can connect on deeper levels, without the promise of friendship, I think that it's probably fair to say that the sort of core wellspring of inspiration for the work that we do would maybe dry up a little bit. Because part of what we want to remind the American people of is the fact that there is goodness within individuals who have starkly different moral and social and political starting points than we do, but who nevertheless in the way that they live their lives demonstrate the, demonstrates the fact that we share a commitment to some basic grounding uh, of human well-being, and that part of the project we are engaged in is developing the empathy and the connections and the language that allow us to be able to unearth these commonalities in terms that we can share and understand. 
And so there is a way in which Braver Angels work is explicitly about the task of building friendship, even if we don't expect every encounter or even most encounters to necessarily produce that sort of, that sort of comedy, but that potential is always there. And as a country, we hope that we can do everything we can to make it more and more possible for those of us who feel so disparately disconnected from one another now to eventually find one another in friendship. So I wanna dive now into the subject of, of friendship itself. What is its meaning? What is its significance to us as individuals, to us as a society, in our personal lives and in our politics? Um, and so Lexi, I think you're the right person to sort of kick us off in earnest uh, on this topic, in part because you're the one with the bright idea and I think it was a good one. Um, so yeah, Lexi, uh, go ahead and tell us why, um, why should we be talking about friendship here today? You know, why is the subject important to you? Hi everyone, my name is Lexi Hudson and it's so wonderful to see uh, so many of you joining us this evening for a conversation on friendship. Uh, as John, I think John mentioned, I'm the curator of Civic Renaissance, a newsletter dedicated to beauty, goodness, and truth and reviving uh, the wisdom of the past to help heal our divides today. And when I approached Luke and John, um, two of my very good friends about this conversation on friendship, there were a few reasons um, why I thought it was particularly important to talk about this, this topic now. We have been in lockdown for over a year now, and many of us have gone without seeing family or friends um, other than being digitally mediated, which we all know isn't quite the same. And it's, it's interesting how um, it's been a study in contrast. We, we know how much friendship means to us because we've gone so long without it. And one thing that has struck me about the pandemic is how it, it really laid bare problems that already existed and it made worse problems that already were, were um, in existence in our country. For example, um, there have been a number of decades where uh, the loneliness crisis and mental health crisis and suicide epidemic and opioid crisis, had, they've been on the ascendant. Um, deaths of despair um, have been on the ascendant in recent decades. And we know we have, we have data that, that um, evidences unsurprisingly that these have only gotten worse in, time, in this time of isolation and lockdown. Um, and, and what I think this reveals is something that we all know intuitively and wise people across history, across culture have noted that we were not created to be alone. We were created to be in friendship. We were created to be in community. We become fully human. We become fully ourselves in community. And, um, and I think that we this 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 last year has shown us that um, all the more. And and I wanted to convene this conversation tonight about um, what we can do maybe differently in this post pandemic era. The world is reopening. I'm I'm and the, and the weather is getting better. There are so many reasons I think uh, to be hopeful right now at this moment in time. And I think convening this 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 dialogue uh, with John, Bill, and all of you that are on this call to talk about um, how can we how can we use this this fresh start, this new beginning to create uh, stronger relationships that are grounded on on empathy and compassion, as John said, and a fundamental appreciation that we have far more we are far more alike than unlike as human beings and as Americans. And what does that mean for um, for how that how we interact um, in our in our everyday. Of course, Braver Angels is a, as a, a, an incredible grassroots organization uh, committed to depolarization. We're in a very divided moment. And we were in a divided moment before the pandemic, but again, that's one more thing that the pandemic exacerbated. We, it, it's no secret that, <laughs> that Braver Angels' mission and work is needed now more than ever. Um, and, and, I, and I hope that, that the dialogue here this evening will be um, just, just a way to kind of dig into what is friendship, uh, what is what is true friendship, and and how can we how can we get um, get more of it um, to the end of, of of happier, more fulfilled existences as human beings, and and a more maybe united um, and hopeful future as a country. So there are some thoughts, John, on on why we're here. <laughs> well, that's good for that's good for starters, Lexi. Thank you, and uh, Bill. Now, Bill, we are here speaking to um, uh, to to the home crowd or to, to quite a few folks from the home crowd, so to speak. And so many people will be familiar with you and your work. Um, but for those who aren't, I'd love for you to say a little bit about it. I mean, what I'll say about you briefly is that you are 
in addition to being a co-founder of Braver Angels, the architect of so much of our programming, so much of our uh, workshops and uh, what we actually offer to the world concretely. And uh, what I'm wondering is in the context of your work, how explicitly does questions, do questions of friendship arise? And what is the importance of friendship both to personal well-being and to democratic well-being, if you will? Okay, well, thanks, John, and hello, everybody. Um, so, John, I'm going to act like a politician and take your question at where I want to go. Not where <laughs> That's all I expect. I'll just use that as your, you handed the ball to me, and I'll just do what I want. Okay, is that all right? <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll, I'll get to what, what, you're, you were, you were, what you want me to talk about. But I, so I was listening to Lexi and feeling inspired. Uh, I also felt inspired then to talk about how friendship is imperiled now, which is why we're having the conversation, right? Lexi, if it was, everything was great, we wouldn't be talking about it. Um, so I want to tell a story about um, what well, was before the, the great uh, lockdown. Uh, and it was a Sunday morning at my church in St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, two different people came up to me, people I've known for a long time, um, with, uh, who know I'm connected with Braver Angels with almost identical stories. That in the last month they had lost lifelong friendships. They, they lost lifelong friends over politics and over Twitter wars and Facebook wars. Um, and not just defriending, somebody defriended them, but, but th th their friends said enough, I'm going to have nothing more to do with you. And these were friends that went back to elementary school, um, you know, with, with roots so far back. And uh, they were, each of these two people, uh, the church members of my, they lost sleep over this. I mean, it deeply, deeply troubled them. Uh, mm -hmm. These were, you, you, don't, you don't replace somebody who you uh, sat next to in first grade you know, when, uh, when they leave your life. So uh, friendships are imperiled now in a polarized era, um, not just politics imperiled, friendships are imperiled. The second part of, the, of this, I want to introduce some data from Robert Putnam, a social scientist who wrote the book Bowling Alone, who has been um, looking at friendship and the decline in America <clears throat> in the number of friends people have and the amount of engagement we have with our friends. Uh, and this has been a, a, you know, a long-term trend um, that we could, you know, probably as many, many sources, uh, but um, to the extent that we lose friends, we are less engaged, as Lexi said, with community because our friends connect us with community. Um, and we become more isolated. When we become more isolated, we are more prone uh, to um, exaggerated stories about what's going on. We're more prone to political leaders of any side um, who um, agitate us. Um, and um, we, feel more, we feel more alone in the world and, and less trusting of the world. Mm -hmm. So another bit of data on this is that the average American is much less trusting of other average Americans over the last four years, a big decline in social trust. So we, um, we, uh, friendship is a way to build civic trust and particularly friendship across differences. And I know we'll be talking a fair amount about that because, you know, going back to Aristotle, um, you know, the, 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 the friendship that's based on spontaneous mutual interest and compatibility. We like each other. We went to the same, we root for the same sports teams. We have kids the same age. We, you know, we live in the same neighborhood. That's all, that's beautiful. And we need to have those and keep cultivating those. But then there's also something called civic friendship, which is we, we come together, not mainly based on the fact of spontaneous similarity and liking one another, but we come together to work on something that we both think is important. And through that, uh, we deepen our relationship. So those are some initial thoughts to to, to, to get to, to, to get my thoughts out there. I think I answered at least some of what you asked me there, John. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, you know, when you've got when you've got your seniority, Bill, uh, you know, <laughs> you, can, you can take the question, do with it uh, what you will. But no, I think that you I think that you hit the uh, hit the notes that I was uh, that I was asking for. Um, and um, yeah, so it's 
it's an interesting thing. Uh, working at Braver Angels, I get um, letters and correspondence from people all the time uh, who, uh, you know, tell me stories about uh, relationships that were important to them that fell apart, uh, that broke apart under the, um, under the strain of political differences. And, um, you know, there are, of course, many reasons why friendships may falter, but I think that what's so uh, bitter for many of us, at least, about the moment that we live in is the fact that, you know, politics, I think, for many people was an area of life that, you know, you know at least, uh, you know, a few decades ago, maybe, and, and even, you know, and it's only gotten worse, obviously, even within the last several years, but you go back in time, not too terribly far. And um, the idea that you would lose a friendship based on who somebody voted for um, was, I think, for most folks, relatively um, alien sort of, sort of notion. Um, and now at a moment where so many other things are already tearing at our ability to remain in community with each other, and, you know, I mean, that, that includes technology, that includes, uh, you know, sort of, in, in some respects, the financial hardships that visit people, the need to, you know, work to a certain degree to where it may not be possible to keep up the cadence of activity that allows one to uh, maintain a friendship, right? Because some folks will say that friendship is itself in part a product of consistency, being able to touch base and, and maintain communication, so on and so forth. On top of so many other things, uh, we now have developed a culture wherein there's some pressure for us to take strong moral stands, not just in favor of what we believe, but against those who believe otherwise, even if they're folks with whom we've shared a relationship or even a home. Um, uh, we've we've seen it all uh, here. Um, so, Lexi, to turn it to turn it back over to you, um, and feel free to be like Bill and to just take your answer to the question wherever you want it to go. But I think that part of what I, I imagine might be useful is to reflect a little bit on you know sort of how we got here and 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 what what we misunderstand about the significance of friendship that might allow us to transgress the, uh, the, uh, the wisdom of Thomas Jefferson in, in excommunicating people from our lives uh, over differences that in the larger context of things might not actually be as important as the bonds that we share or ought to share. It's, it's a great question and a series of, of reflections, John, very insightful. Um, Bill mentioned um, the, the work of Robert Putnam, who's been studying the decline of American civic life uh, over uh, a, number of touch, a, a, number of, a number of touchstones. And I actually just wrote a paper um, in 2020 updating his, his, uh, his report. Um, it's funny, people talk about Putnam's work as if it was written yesterday, but he uses data from 25, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Just like toss that around, and so I, I went and looked back at you know where where what would data do use then and where are we now and it's kind of a mixed bag. For example, we are the the, the decline in church communities and religiosity that has that has continued, and we are less religious today. And of course, religion religious communities are a place where we have found community and meaning and friendship. That that's a if, if you are religious, that is a huge part of your life, and that's a natural place where you'll find people who care have the same values, the same prism, the same paradigm um, through which they you, they view the world. Um, but in in other in other ways, um, like volunteering, that's actually stayed the same. That hasn't been just getting worse, like some people might might think. So it is more of a nuanced mixed bag than um, than just a monolithic narrative of decline, which is kind of good news. Um, but of course, there is uh, there is no question that um, we, we do know, for example, that suicides are up, deaths of despair are up, um, de deaths related to um, alcoholism and, and the opioid crisis. And, and of course, our time of isolation hasn't, hasn't helped that. Bill, Bill talked about how um, we've become more um, 
more sensitive in, in recent in, 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 as, as Americans during the lockdown. And that's definitely, that's corroborated by uh, researchers who study rural communities. They study either people in, you know, Antarctica or people in, in social isolation in, um, in solitary confinement. And they find that these people that go long periods of time without human interaction, they're really prone to offense and they're really prone to um, getting sensitive, exactly what Bill said. And I think that's a moment for us all to reflect where we're Passions also are, are running high generally right now. Uh, what are ways that we can kind of just recover the, the, the joy and beauty of friendship and, and, and maybe not take things so seriously, maybe not, maybe not allow politics to have to have like grabbed hold of so much of our of our consciousness and our passion and our, and our minds. And you know, with these, with these civic, many of these civic touchstones. On, on the decline, uh, what are what are ways that we can we can rebuild? Our, and 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 I think that we have a lot of agency and power to do that in our everyday. And I think we all have a lot more motivation to do that now. Now that we've gone so long without having, you know regular contact with people, with people in our lives. Um, and and I and, and to one little story to share that it can be done, John, uh, before he passed the microphone over to me, mentioned Thomas Jefferson. And I love the story of um, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. They were kind of like founding frenemies. They were arch political enemies. Um, they hated each other. They called each other horrible names. Uh, I think I, I pulled it up here that um, Thomas, uh, team Jefferson said that if uh, if Adams was elected, then our daughters would be uh, prostitutes and it, like just horrible, horrible things were said. Like we think our public discourse today is bad, but it was pretty bad then. This is the election of 1800. Um, but what's interesting, when they both kind of retired from public life, they they realized that politics actually wasn't that big of a deal. And they started kind of re, they picked up their friendship. They started corresponding via letters and we have hundreds of letters that they wrote to each other. And it's super sweet. They they started talking about what they were reading. Like Jefferson said, I've given up newspapers in exchange for Tacitus and Thucydides, for New Newton and for Euclid, Euclid. And I find myself much happier, which makes sense, right? Like he's not consumed with a news cycle, which is even more true for us today. Like news is not gonna make you happy. <laughs> so. Jefferson, you know, is sharing this with Adams. Like, I'm not reading the newspapers as much, and I'm reading more Euclid, and I'm a lot happier. And they exchange tips on, you know, their exercise routines and what they're eating. And it's just like they they realize that there's so much more things that they have in common, and and they just have, just have a, a basic and recovered that like a very basic sort of civic friendship. I like those two two distinctions of friendship that Bill mentioned a second ago. Second ago, the Aristotelian sort of spontaneous shared interest friendship. Um, Aristotle and and Cicero said that the highest end of man Man is is friendship founded on virtue, on on a shared orientation towards the true and the good and the beautiful, um, and yet and and related to that, I don't think they're separate entirely at all. But there 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 there's that civic friendship, you know, friendship just founded on um, founded on on a common goal of like just just um, you know statesmanship and being a, being a good citizen and and and, and dignity in public life. Um, so. Uh, I, it's we're in a it, we're in a, um, a, a some kind of predicament right now, um, but it's not it's not hopeless by any means. Friendships have been rebuilt as that as that story between the founding frenemies Adams and Jefferson shows, and and we we can do that too. So uh, yeah, I'd like to pick up on on one of the threads of John, if I can just sort of uh, charge, Char charge right in, in not, not, <laughs> not pass the ball back all the way around um that's well they call that a steal that's that was an interception right yeah well, alexa and i'll let you know when you can come back in john i'll give you a signal how's that right <laughs> okay um so just to, one of the challenges that i was thinking about as you were talking lexi is that um with politics now um one of the words that people use all the time is existential okay mm -hmm. Yeah. We're in an existential crisis. Uh, existential is a word I learned back in college many years ago, you know, the existentialist, <laughs> and it was angst, you know, and we love to think about existential. Uh, but, uh, and then the next time I began to hear it was with, um, with uh, like the nuclear threat as an existential threat. And then of course, Israel, an existential threat, you know, if you're surrounded by nations that, that you know, want to eliminate you. Th those were, th those were, were the places where that, Kind of that term was in the public discourse. Now it is everywhere. 
the next the next uh, congressional elections are existential. Everything is existential, uh, which means everything is on the line. The core, uh, you know, the, the, our, the, our deepest core values are at stake in a, a, a legislation being passed. I'm pretty soon we're going to hear that the filibuster decision is existential. Okay, and I don't mean to trivialize it because these things are important. We are dealing with important values now and, and those clash and major policies. So I don't mean to disparage the seriousness with which we should look at policy and electoral politics, but, but oh my goodness, when, when everything is, is existential, when everything is so threatening, because that's what the existential means, but if, if, I, if I lose, and you, Lexi, voted for somebody who I believe is an existential threat or their party your party is an existential threat to everything I hold true and beautiful and dear. Mm-hmm. How do we maintain a friendship? How do we start one and how do we maintain it? Mm-hmm. And so m- one of my answers to that is that we, it's okay to be as passionate as we want and need to be about the issues of our day. The, I think what we're doing is we are, uh, we are uh, confusing the person in our life with the politicians that that person supports and with those policies. And so then you become uh, a member of a whole different tribe of human beings who, who want to hurt the nation. Uh, and if, if I believe that about you, how can, we, how can we be friends? So part of what I've learned in, in, in Braver Angels is that there is, there are, in addition to just other interests we have in our families and our world and, and art and beauty, that even across um, uh, uh, stark differences in policies and politicians we support, if we look for it, there are usually or almost always fundamental values we hold in common and fundamental aspirations we hold for our country, for our children, our grandchildren, for future generations. That, that when we get past who we vote for and uh, what we think about gun control or vote suppression or, or, you know, or voter fraud or whatever, um, that, that there's this common level of human values that we have. Mm-hmm. And when we can get there, we can hold on to our friendship. Can I intercept John back yeah. really quick? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Interception, granted. <laughs> so I, I really appreciate what, what Bill said, you know, how do we grapple with friendship when the stakes just seem so high, where it's no longer, it seems like things are no longer in the realm of just intellectual differences, but they're, it's moral. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you are morally inferior if you think differently than me and you're not maybe you're not even human the way I am because you're maybe you're less evolved. There's like, there's just like kind of this, this um, evolu- evolution in how we talk about these differences. And, and one thing I've been thinking about, I'm writing a book on civility and civil discourse and trying to reimagine the terms of engagement for our public square and what um, both, both, both the idealized form and actually like Plausibly, like what, what are, what could, what could, what, what is realistic um, in terms of how things could be just a little bit better than they are, um, and and one thing I've been thinking a lot about, uh, especially as it relates to friendship, is is this notion of of truth telling. Like good friends tell the truth, and and it doesn't mean that um, you know being being friends that have people that have differences of opinion, maybe, maybe it's such that it's so, so, so fraught and sensitive. You just, you don't talk about, you know, the sensitive areas that the areas of disagreement, but all, but maybe you have such a friendship that you are empowered to actually say what you think. And like, it's only because you know that you have so many other things in common and you have that basic level of, of trust and affection. That's the only way that you can talk about the really important mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And today, it feels like our public leaders and even people, maybe some people on this call that, that disagree with each other on serious issues, there just is that utter lack of like that basic af- affection and basic trust that is necessary to talk about, talk about the pain points. Mm. Yeah. You know, one of my um, favorite <laughs> uh, political friendships, I, I don't, I, I mean, you know, I guess we can call it political. One of my favorite uh, public friendships to uh, observe over the last um, however many years has been the uh, uh, the friendship that exists, seems to exist between um, uh, former First Lady Michelle Obama and former President George W. Bush. 
And uh, it's, you know, and it seems to just be kind of a natural affection that they seem to have for each other. I mean, you guys have probably seen the pictures of them hugging and so forth and different events. And every time they get, there's, you know, some event that brings the first families together, the two of them always seem to gravitate. And I always thought that that was sort of, sort of cool. You know, I, I, I always see the cynical sort of social media posts that say, yes, well, the globalists love each other from each party and people always find a reason to sort of be, you know, be upset uh, at, at things like that. Some people do. But the wonderful thing about that is that it does seem to give folks permission, I think, a bit uh, to, to really sort of, to, to really reach out and, and in an in a earnest feeling sort of way, you know, um, touch the humanity of somebody who you would on the basis of politics perhaps have every reason to excommunicate uh, according to the norms, the social norms that have um, influenced our, our ways of, of dealing with each other today. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yet, you know, I, I do come up against this, um, this thing that people will, will focus on, this question, um, when is it okay to cut somebody out of out of your life, right? Um, Bill, I think that one of our earlier conversations uh, was about um, sort of the advice that is oftentimes given in, in therapy and in counseling, where sometimes I, I, I take it anyway, that much of the consultation that can be given to people who are trying to understand how to deal with family and so forth is consultation aimed at showing you when it's okay to cut somebody out of your life and maybe equal equal focus is not given to how it is we can salvage relationships, how it is we can prepare them. There seems to be a focus on personal well-being that leaps pretty quickly to getting rid of people. Like there are, you know, like there are, uh, uh, I don't know, shoes that no longer fit or something like that. Well, that's probably a bad example. <laughs> Once shoes fit, they tend to stay fitting. Uh, but you get the point though, Bill. Uh, is, is, um, is, is there something to be, to be said about the, you know, is it more than just politics? Is there a general sort of trend towards just putting people out of our lives? And, and what's the antidote for, for that, kind of, uh, that kind of thinking? Yeah, I, it's what, what I uh, uh, believe is the consumer culture uh, invading all aspects of life, including family, including friendships. Consumer culture being that uh, a friendship is there for me, the friend is there as, as, uh, as, I, as, as that person benefits me. Mm. Uh, marriage becomes a, life, a, a lifestyle uh, to make me happy. Um, um, and so um, if, if, uh, if I'm distressed in a relationship with a loved one, um, there's a lot out there in our culture of disposability uh, that says um, ditch them. Uh, and uh, so I'm actually finishing a book about this in terms of the world of psychotherapy, because we therapists are part of a larger culture as well. And there are too many therapists who I'm afraid if somebody would to bring an anguish about a relationship driven, uh, split apart by politics or friendship or family, uh, um, I, I think too many of my fellow therapists would say, why are you, why are you dealing with that stress? Uh, you know, why, why not move on? Um, and, um, and, and, and the reality is if we care about people, um, and Lexi, going back to what you were saying, there's those bonds of affection, but also those bonds of connection, those bonds of commitment. And so the, an antidote to a consumer mentality is a commitment mentality. Okay, Th this, this is my caravan. This is my convoy in life. This is my family. Th these, are, these are my friends. I'm gonna, gonna do everything I can to hold on. Now, obviously, if somebody is being horribly abusive, well, that's not about their politics. It's about them being terribly abusive and I may need to set some boundaries with them. But I can't imagine ever, ever writing somebody out of my life who, who I care for because of their political views. I can't imagine ever, ever doing that. Now, if they showed up at every party, uh, and, and harassed me and everybody else. Well, there's, you know, I tell them they have to back off until they behave better. Uh, but there's something deeper than that. And the last thing I'll say in terms of the academic part of this is a wonderful uh, philosopher named Nell Nadis who talks about ethical caring mm. versus natural caring. 
And so the natural caring is the, 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 the uh, it's what parents feel for their, their children, you know, their babies and how, as somebody we, we just relate to, they're like us. But, for, but ethical caring kicks in when the natural caring isn't working. And mm-hmm. so when I feel alienated from somebody, when I feel turned off by somebody, how do I access the, that ethical part of me that says, I care about this person, I care about this relationship, I'm going to hang in there and find a way to restore the caring and restore the relationship. Hmm. Can I can I add something, John? Really? Yeah, by all means. By all means. So I I um love what what Bill said, and I'd like to add two two ideas. Um, one what uh, about this question about how to how to um in, engage with people that have views that we disagree with vehemently. Um, one one idea, one approach is a, a jurisdictional one, kind of. D- distinguishing between the public square, the private square. I mean, Bill said a second ago, he can't imagine cutting someone off that that he loves over a difference of, of a politics and opinion. And I think it makes sense to um, to separate out what do we what do we owe a public figure versus what what do we owe you know our grandparent or our sibling or or a parent um, or someone really close to us that that has a, a view that we we disagree with and I think that um, we owe the people closest to us a lot more and 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 this relates to uh, and I think that could that can be useful that we don't have to have this kind of moral purity high standard for all people equally like just having this more kind of nuanced approach the public square I don't owe them the same do du- I don't have the same duties to them uh, a, po- a generic politician or a talking head or the latest person saying something inflammatory on Twitter. I don't have to have the same loyalty to them that I do, you know, someone who's actually related to me or someone I actually have a, you know, a history with and, 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 and I love. Um, and this relates to a second idea that I'm experimenting with. And so I'd welcome, I'd welcome feedback. Um, I, I'm just kind of thinking through it. Um, what about the concept of unbundling people? Okay, hear me out. So, so we hear, we've heard a lot about unbundling education, which I love, like taking it out of just, you know, one size fits all thing in the classroom. We've heard a lot, even in the, in the wake of uh, very serious um, racial, uh, protests against racial injustice in our country, we've heard one policy proposal, unbundling the police. That's been one kind of interesting uh, policy proposal. But what about unbundling unbundling people, like, and just using that sort of mental framework as a way to say, you know, this is a, a, an idea they have that I really don't like, but here's all this other other stuff, other parts of who they are that I love, and just kind of separating those, those a little bit intellectually and mentally, and, and, and not ignoring it entirely, but just viewing the part in light of the whole, and not letting the part totally negate the value of the whole, like not negating the value of our inherent dignity and worth as human beings and not, you know, erasing an entire history, a lifelong friendship. Um, and and I, I think that this could even help maybe our broader kind of societal conversation. We hear a lot about cancel culture today. We hear a lot about things that people said 20 years ago or five years ago or did um, now coming back and, and they lose their jobs and they lose their friends and they get shamed online. They're just, there are really high consequences for that. And, and it's an interesting question for all of us. Like no one is perfect. If there's any, if there's any one content, any one universal about humanity, it's our, it's our flawed nature. And, you know, how, how would we like to be defined by us at our worst? And imagine if that got, that got put online, wouldn't we like to be seen, you know, our worst alongside of our best as well. Um, so anyway, I'm not totally wedded to the idea. Maybe there are maybe there are problems with it, but it's just it's just one idea. It's just kind of a mental framework I'm kind of thinking about, and I'd love your guys' thoughts. Hmm. Well, I, I think that it's um, I, I I think it's a pretty uh, clever way of getting at an important uh, truth. What I what I think is an important truth anyway, which is that we do want to draw a distinction. I think between what it is people believe and who it is people actually are, certainly in relation to us as individuals. Now, you know, perhaps there are are connections between those things. I'm sure that there are connections. Um, You're making me, Lexi, uh, think of uh, an email I got from uh, one of our members who uh, happened to be an African-American woman uh, who's in a a interracial relationship, uh, interracial marriage, uh, with a white with a white man whose brother uh, her brother in law uh, voted for President Trump and she's uh, she's a liberal liberal Democrat 
and uh, she talked about how she was experiencing this this agonizing uh, conflict within herself. She never thought about her brother-in-law's politics before President Trump was elected. Didn't even know he was a Republican, much less that he would come to uh, support Donald Trump. And on the one hand, you know, she felt very, uh, very much sort of at home in the view that to support President Trump is to support a racist and to support someone who was actively seeking to harm people of color in America. On the other hand, her brother-in-law is one of her favorite and most respected and one of the people she cares most about in the world. Uh, he's somebody who had been there for her and her husband in difficult times in their marriage. He'd, he'd, some, he'd been someone who'd gotten up in the middle of the night um, to fix a busted pipe or to uh, give her a charge if her car had gone dead on the side of the road. He was someone who I think her, her children loved and had affection for, someone who she had deep, deep affection for, along with his, his whole family. And she, you know, she wrote uh, to me and sort of, you know, telling this story and, and expressing her hope that Braver Angels could help her reconcile the conflict that she was experiencing emotionally, psychologically, between on the one hand, you know, believing that this person's politics were in essence, you know, something close to evil, while believing that this person himself was also someone who was, who was beautiful and moral and, and good as a human being. And um, I suppose that, uh, you know, I, I, I suppose that I'm on some level, I'm, I'm saddened by the fact that society has put us in a position to where these things seem so, so clearly at odds with each other. And yet it's totally understandable, just given the way reality is at the moment in our country that we should experience these, these difficulties. Mm -hmm. Bill, we're gonna go to questions uh, fairly uh, shortly here, but I just, maybe we've already tread upon this ground, but I just, I just um, wonder um, if in the clinical or other contexts, you know, how you tend to deal, if you were giving that person advice, or if anybody else and listening to us right now is in that position or has friends who are, what is, what is the straightforward thing to, uh, to tell them? Oh, straightforward is that's a, that's a high bar there, John. So <laughs> I'll, I'll just come up with something. And also to, to, to uh, uh, the, uh, I just want to go back to the, uh, the unbundling thing too. So we, we don't leave you out there. Right. So I just, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the unbundling as well. And, and what I made of that, and I'll tie it into what you're asking, John, is um, that there is a story behind everybody. It, it almost an infinitely complex story behind everybody's life and how they came to the views that they have and who, who, the, who, they, who they affiliate with. Mm -hmm. and, and what happens is we, what we're doing increasingly now is taking uh, political views or people we, we voted for and say, I know everything I need to know about you. I, I, the, the, the small part of you is now the whole. I, I, this is what we right. do with racial issues. This is what we did historically with religious issues. If I know if you are this religion, this race, I know all I need to know about you uh, to distance from you. Um, and so it's the part in the whole. So what I, and I do, I see people in therapy like this all the time, is, is, is for them to, uh, A, ask themselves, can, can you find the strength to stay in relationship, to not have to flee from somebody and not have to change somebody? Those are the two things we do when we get anxious. You have to change so that I feel better. OK, or otherwise I can't be in a relationship with you. So it's a self anxiety management in that relationship. And secondly, to to try to understand, to be curious, what's the backstory? And, and I'll end this. And I know we have lots of questions, which is great. I want to I, I want to also say, Lexi, so I want to. I'd like your distinction between what we owe the others out there and what we owe people close to us. And I wanna add something now that is, uh, you know, maybe, maybe I'll push the envelope here. But after <laughs> January 6th, when I watched those videos over and over and over, and I was doing my morning meditation and I found myself 
deeply trying to resist the temptation to make those people moral monsters. Even though I am appalled at what, what people did invading the Capitol and threatening so many lives and killing people, it's horrible. But what, where, where I am is that I'm afraid if I demean and make moral monsters, even a political leader, a criminal, a mass murderer, that that's going to leak into how I view people closer to me in my life. And so what I'm personally aiming for is to not have a cleavage there, although, of course, they have obligations to the people closest to me. So that will be my final comment. And we get lots of hands up, which is cool. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bill. And um, yeah, that that takes us into uh, into the Q and A part of our of our event tonight, and I do see the hands. So uh, we're going to go ahead and take folks' questions. Uh, feel free if you want to address the question to Bill or Lexi or myself, or if you just want to throw it out as a jump ball, that's totally fine. Um, try and resist the temptation that I often give into to make uh, your question a five minute sort of speech, followed by you know. Uh, something of a question mark with a bit of an afterthought at the end, because we do want to get as many of your questions in as you can. But I think it'll be okay if folks want to give just a little bit of context or preamble. That that's fine. But we're 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 just going to be mindful of mindful of the time. So if we have to shorten people a little bit, uh, you will see us do so. Okay, great. So uh, now let's go ahead and start off with I'm going to say uh, Debbie. Debbie, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Hey, thanks everybody. Nice to be with y'all this evening. I'd like to go deeper with Lexi's uh, comments about uh, unbundling. And uh, I often, uh, I, I share a lot of the thoughts that you have, Lexi, and I've oftentimes called it unpacking. And for me, it has to do with how do we stay out of black and white thinking? It seems like human beings always get into trouble when we start thinking in terms of black and white um, and, and like it's either this or that, nothing in between, right? And so it's, it's the challenges to how do we get more nuanced mm -hmm. in our appreciation for what another person, who they are and you know all the things that you have so, you've addressed so well. Um, and the other thing I wanted to add to that is where is there a possibility for redemption if we don't have a nuanced view mm -hmm. of a situation, right? That it isn't black or white. There is lots of gray in Absolutely. there. So, and I also find that it has a lot to do with trust, is that trust is killed when we get stuck in these polarities. Mm -hmm. So that's all. Thank you for your thoughts. No, thank you, Debbie. I, I um lot very rich series of comments there um in terms i think it's a really interesting question why are why is du duality like just dichotomies why is that so seductive why do we go there either or yeah why, yeah black and white either or um why is nuance this the millions of shades of gray why is that so uncomfortable because we love certitude. We, we yearn to know and to feel okay. I think all of us deep down fundamentally as human beings want to know, want to just know and know that we're okay. And not knowing the answer makes us, makes us wonder, are we okay? And that's why getting information that either is in discord or kind of opens up the possibility that we might, ha not, might not have all the answers. Like that's a deeply vulnerable, a deeply uncomfortable place to be. And our response is like fight or flight. Like we immediately shut it down and run away. <laughs> and our, our news culture right now feeds into that. Like it just, it just, it, and it, it has benefited from that at our expense tremendously. Um, I've reported and written about um, the decline of local and regional news outlets across the country over the last few decades, which is sad and very important because it's just made our public discourse so much more nationalized. And mm -hmm. while local and regional outlets are faltering, the big outlets, um, print and television, have made a killing the last four years. Donald Trump was great for our national, our national media outlets. And, and they have, 
you know, fed us like both, not, not both and it's either or stories um, that just feeds this kind of lizard brain part of our psyche that just wants to know and is uncomfortable with uncertainty, uncomfortable with, hmm, like, you know, shades of gray. Um, and what to do, I, I don't know, Debbie, did you ask what we do about it? Like, let's, let's like turn off the television and, you know, go make some new friends and, and control what we can control. We can't control what's happening in Washington, but we can control how we conduct ourselves. And I have a real high opinion of um, the power of each of us to, to reclaim sovereignty over our sphere of influence and heal our country right where you are. And that's why you should all become members of, of Braver Angels if you're not already because, and support their incredibly important work. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Debbie. And thank you, Lexi, uh, for, the, for the plug there at the end. Um, yeah, that was a terrific, that was a terrific opening to our questions, Debbie. And so let's keep it going with uh, John Reimers. John, go ahead and uh, oh, wow. ask your question. Thank you. Um, I've been a, a member of uh, Braver Angels for uh, maybe a year or so. And uh, I love these conversations. I'm, and friendship is a big issue for me. Um, I live in a co-housing community and, and uh, uh, I put a high value on friendships. My concern is that what do we do when people don't want to engage in a conversation with us? And that's what I find with a lot of the, uh, uh, when we start talking about political discussions, because I think our system has, has role modeled uh, has role modeled that we do not get along. They've role modeled that we stay separate and you, you vilify anybody who believes differently than you. And uh, I've seen, I've seen uh, relationships break up because one person wants to form a friendship, but the other person doesn't want to. And uh, you know, I think, I think to a certain extent, um, Braver Angels is a self-selective organization where they, the people who are, would come to this conversation are people that are open to a discussion from, with people that have different views. And I guess what I'm very concerned about is the people that I'm most concerned about would never come to this kind of forum to have a discussion. And I guess, I guess my, my challenge or question is, what do we do with people that aren't willing to look at themselves or, or look at friendships and, and collaboration as being important and are just so, so stuck on um, whatever their political view is? Bill, Mr. Reimers raises um, uh, raises a, a challenging uh, point. Is that something you would like to respond to? Well, John, I thought you would handle the hard questions, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll make a go at that one. Um, so um, I, I believe in the social contagion theory of social change. Uh, and that is, uh, it starts um, it starts with the choir. It starts with people who who, um, who value and believe something, and who, by the way, it, it, it's still hard to do. It's not like those of us in Braver Angels, it's a piece of cake uh, to, to, to do this. So we kind of need each other to keep working on it. Um, and, and then um, people who would never darken one of our workshops can be influenced by those who do, by those who do. Uh, so that's where we start. We start with those, those of us who want to change our consciousness, uh, develop our abilities, and show it in our lives, uh, and uh, and then it spreads. And 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 so one other thing I'll say is a lot of times those friendships that break up, it isn't just that somebody it would, you know was rigid. It's often that both one or both of them are rigid, because in a lot of those conversations, like I talked about the two people at my church, when we drilled down on what they said on Twitter, <laughs> I understood why their friend uh, got upset. Uh, so so we can all do better. Of maintaining relationships where we accept and appreciate somebody who is different from us. So a really important question. My summary is uh, 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 when people say, well, Braver Angels is the choir 
is self-selected, I say that's where social movements begin with mm -hmm. a choir. I think I've said in the past that two types of people uh, attend Braver Angels workshops, uh, the people who are happy and excited to be there and people who are dragged along by somebody, uh, somebody else who was. But a lot of times those people wind up being happy and excited to have been there as well. Um, excellent. So let's keep going. Uh, I see Jonas Fields. Hey, Jonas. How you doing, brother? Hey, John. Uh, first off, thank you, uh, everyone, for, for everything that you shared. I agree that this is uh, very, very uh, essential, especially given the current uh, pandemic and everything like that. So thank you for, for setting this up. I wrote my question down because I have, have a tendency to go too deep. But um, and this is for for everyone as well. Um, I, I have a fear that that it's not so much a, a friendship crisis. There is a friendship crisis, but maybe the root of that is really an, a, a personal identity crisis. <clears throat> we've talked a lot about how we view others and how we engage with others. But I, I guess my question is, how much do you think that this is more of a reflection on how we're identifying and and judging ourselves my fear is that we are tending to use descriptors you know race gender political leaning as definitions of who we are mm -hmm. and so therefore i am this i am this so therefore that's who i am whereas we are very stratified we're very complex and if that's how we see ourselves then that's how we're going to see other people. So I wonder how much of it is really a reflection of, of self-care and just really coming to grips on you are not all these labels. You're not the descriptors. You are something deeper than that. So I'm really curious about your feedback on that. Mm. Well, I think I, I would like to take a, take a swing at that one to start with. Um, you know, I'm a, Jonas, as I think you may know, I'm a, I'm a bit of an amateur um, moral philosopher. And one of the things that I spend a fair amount of time uh, uh, pondering is the, the difference between viewing one's ethical or moral character um, through the lens of sort of a, uh, uh, perhaps a, a deontological sort of sort of framework, a lens which says that, okay, a good person is a person who subscribes to X, Y, and Z set of opinions um, versus a, an idea of morality and character that is rooted in, in, in the vocabulary of virtue, you might say. So in other words, it's possible for us to look at ourselves and to look at other people and judge their moral worth on the basis of what they believe, how they identify in various different ways. Um, are you forward looking in your opinions? Uh, are, do you have the, the right religion, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's also possible for us to evaluate each other on the basis of whether or not we exemplify honesty, honor, integrity, compassion, understanding, perhaps regardless of where we land in terms of our religious or political beliefs. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I think that the things that we think, the things that we believe as matters of opinions can certainly change. And, you know, a person can vote one way or another, but regardless of which way a person votes, that doesn't necessarily tell you too much about whether or not that person is going to be there for you when your mother dies. You know, that doesn't tell you too much about whether or not that person is going to go deep into their pocket uh, to help you out when you're facing a moment of material distress. There are things that people do that demonstrate who they are on the inside, as well as, you know, demonstrating their capacity to evolve and change and learn in their views and perspectives. Humility is a virtue, right? Um, the willingness to listen to others uh, and to to accept the fact that while we all have our opinions, we ought to know that we don't know everything and therefore should remain, um, remain uh, open-minded to, to evolving in our, in our understandings. Mm. These are virtues. These to me are the elements of character from which we should derive our moral evaluations of others and certainly ourselves. And when we try to achieve the state of 
being able to think of ourselves as a good person, as a good person, uh, on the basis of our political ideology, let's say, to me, that's taking the easy road um, to, that, that's taking the easy road to a place that's actually very hard to get to. Because it should be the case that genuinely being a good person requires some, some discipline, it requires some cultivation of, of moral habits and perhaps a tempering of our baser impulses. And you can give in to those baser impulses long day, all day long while also having, quote, you know, the right politics. Uh, and so I think that that may be sort of the distinction that you're, you're speaking to, Jonas. And if so, it's, it's something that I uh, think is worth um, shining a light on the differences uh, between. So John, I'd like to just briefly piggyback there and respond to Jonas because it's a provocative, very interesting question that I had not thought about. Um, so picking up on that, Jonas, um, uh, I think of it in terms of uh, having a complex view of oneself versus a more singular view of oneself. Uh, and we live in an age of identity politics uh, in, in which we're invited to take one or two characteristics of ourselves and say that, that that's the core of me. And I think uh, you would probably, if we had a conversation about this, you know, agree to resist that. Uh, the complex view of oneself, multiple aspects. The philosopher, uh, um, Apaya, is that the guy from, uh, anyway, uh, Kawani Apaya, I believe his name, has written some beautiful stuff oh, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, on the multiple identities that we have. Mm -hmm. And in this era, uh, we are almost forced by external uh, uh, forces, the sources, to choose one. Uh, and to go with that. Uh, and so I think your question is really an important one about the, uh, accepting complexity of oneself, ambiguity of oneself, multiple facets of oneself, and to resist the pull to self-identity politics. Mm -hmm. So Jonas, am I capturing some of what you were saying? Uh, ab absolutely. But uh, it, it's, it's more of understanding like there's a lot of things that make me me, right? I'm a husband, I'm a father, think everything of like that. I'm from Ohio, everything like that. Um, but really when it comes down to the essence of who I am, there has to be something that, that grounds that and contextualize everything. And if I'd mess that up or if I allow outside forces to really warp how I view myself, I become more guarded in how I engage mm -hmm. with other people. And so, yeah, that's really, and, and John, John's as well, there's a lot of different virtues and values that, that really identify identify me as an individual but if i'm more secure in who i am and understanding that these are just descriptors of me i'm more likely to look at you and your descriptors and, and instead of judging it in terms of as a threat i'm more i'm more engaged to to, to read the story that is you mm -hmm. you know what i mean which enhances the friendship in my opinion but but mm -hmm. my, if we keep on looking outside saying like hey how do we engage with people out here we're not looking here, and that's my concern. Can I add one more thing, John and, and Jonas? I, I really appreciate the, the, the question. And it reminds me of uh, the truism that hurt people hurt other people. Like if we are wounded, we, we go on wounding others. And that's why psychologists, psychoanalysts like to go back to childhood and try and heal like early traumas so that you stop hurting and stop hurting others and, and perpetuating vicious cycles. And, and relatedly, often people who seem to manifest a lot of loathing, a lot of intolerance of other people, like they're fundamentally intolerant and loathing of themselves too. And this, like what, what would happen if the next time someone was like a little bit loathsome, if we saw that as like a, a cry for of like hurt and help, and didn't react like our lizard brain wants us, would want us to react, which is like, oh, I've been offended, like, you know, fight back. But like said instead, you know, what's, what's the compassionate response here? And, and you know, turning the other cheek and, and, and showing, like responding as if it's a person who's literally bleeding from the head or something, you know, like just having that sort of visual, um, because I think that it, it, it is, it, we're in a moment that it's just like, we, we they, they punch us, we punch right back and it just perpetuates the trauma, perpetuates the, um, the, the division. When 
I think a lot of it, I think you're, a lot of it does come from a place of, 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 of hurt that maybe has nothing to do with politics, but maybe for some people, it's just like an outlet to deal with that hurt uh, that only just per perpetuates um, a, lo a, lot of, a lot of pain and suffering. So yeah, it's a really, a really thoughtful question. Thank you, Jonas. Yeah, we're getting some great questions here. Um, this is a lot of fun for me so far. Um, what a rich, rich topic. Okay, we'll keep going. Uh, Rita Chisholm. Go ahead and unmute and ask us your question. Thank you. Um, interestingly enough, this very subject is what brought me to Braver Angels. Um, I had a uh, I had a friend that I've been friends with for years, and as I'm listening to people talk here, I'm amazed because I really didn't understand that it was. Uh, it was more common than I realized, but I had a friendship that, uh, and I, this is like a 50 year friendship. And I, I was so shocked by what was happening. I just really, I, I was totally amazed. And I want to start from the back forward. Uh oh, Rita, you're frozen. Did we, um, about things? You know, uh, but I that never mattered to me. I really appreciated her for who she was. I loved her. And um, so that wasn't any news to me. Who she voted for wasn't important. Uh, what was most important to me was that we had this, I have a, I really believe in loyalty and friendship. So what happened was it started to, like last April and she started kind of, separating herself from me and, or, or I should say, kind of distancing. And the gentleman earlier made allusion to the fact that there were uh, a lack of communication. Well, that was what was happening to me in that I would ask questions. I would try to engage her in, com in, in you know, civil conversation. I wasn't fighting for either side, but um, I realized that there must be after a lot of prayer, and this has happened over a period of time, I came to understand that there was something foundationally wrong with the relationship. It wasn't something that's, you know, I couldn't overcome. It's just that what I had to understand is that, and I think everyone can, uh, can probably relate to this, in relationships, it's never an equal, uh, you know, at different times, it's different. Feelings are different. You know, for a while, I may really, really be in love with this person, and then I might not like them for a while. So mm -hmm. I kind of felt like I'd always been a very loyal and very loving friend. And I think what I realized is that, and this isn't a, this isn't a, um, I'm sorry, this isn't a, to down her, but I realized that she doesn't love the way that I love. And that's not, that doesn't mean I'm better than her. It's just that I realized that the love that I give is a little different than what she sees because I could never understand someone just not communicating. I mean, and, and act as if it was, I was totally, I just couldn't understand what was going on. So what I came to realize is that there was probably something fundamental, you know, uh, foundationally wrong with the relationship that I just wasn't aware of. And so I think that that's a really, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I guess my question is, and this has this this is another question, uh, Lexi, that I was going to pose to you. I think that there's a difference in the generational understanding of friendship, also. Um, you know, because you're talking about Twitter and Facebook, and you know that that stuff. Facebook was too personal while being impersonal for me personally. But that's the way so many, you know, that's the way so many people, uh, you know, actually communicate now. Does friendship in this day and age, is it the same? You know, I just turned 63. So my understanding of friendship, and, and I will say that, you know, I am a follower of Christ and that really informs who I am uh, to the depth, you know, to my depths. And so, you know, that has a lot to do with the way I view things also, but, but this generational thing, um, is there, is there a big difference with friendships, you know, between older people and younger people? That's a great question. Thank you so much, Rita. I, 
I think that to some extent, yes and no. To some extent, no, because friendship, there is no difference because we are all human and that our need for that community is the same. Um, what is different is, is how technologically adept we are. Um, and, and I mean, actually Robert Putnam uh, had a really interesting conversation about telecommunications in his, in his book, Bowling Alone, that came out in 2000, where he talked about how people, how, how telephone had changed our, the way that we interact, but people weren't picking up the phone and making new friends over the phone. Like, I don't know if anyone has ever befriended a telemarketer on this call tonight, I'd be very impressed with you. Maybe my mom has, she's the most social person I've ever met, but that's not true of the internet. People make friends and, and marry people on the internet all the time. Um, and, and I mean, it also reminds me that young people today, they, they are, I, I think I think the pandemic has even been a little bit much for <laughs> it definitely has for like kids miss their friends they miss school, but um, even even before the pandemic kids were really happy to kind of just be texting and 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 even in the same room with their friends texting them and snapchatting them because they're just that's that's just with the technology that we have and and they're they're more adept with that. Um, so to answer your question, Rita, I'd say yes, but also no. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Well, thank you very much, Rita. Um, and uh, thank you for, for sharing your story, your personal story as well. Um, okay, next let's go to Albert Lone, who looks like he's joining us from a uh, 1950s uh, TV set, maybe. <laughs> That's right, I believe, I believe in gray, not everything is black and white. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's great. Uh, thanks uh, thanks for, uh, for hosting this. Um, this is my first encounter with uh, Better Angels, and I'm glad to have discovered you all. Um, friendship's not a topic one often encounters is you know, something to engage analytically or, or critically, so I, I appreciate the opportunity to listen and, and, and join the conversation. And, and it has me thinking um, about the relationship between art and friendship. Um, and, and I guess the short version of my, my question is, is friendship an art? And, and if so, what, what does that imply? Yeah. And, and I got thinking about this, um, actually just a few minutes before I, I, I signed in here, um, because I, I, re I recalled a, a statement by C.S. Lewis, and, and which the first part of the statement will surprise you because he says, friendship is unnecessary, uh, like philosophy, like art. It has no survival value. Rather, it is one of those things that give great value to survival. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm a lifelong educator uh, and student, and and so you know this this reminds me of um, uh, the concept of the liberal arts, right? Um, and 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 a liberal art is something that is of value to learn in and of itself and not for some secondary utilitarian value. Um, it, re it reminds me of um, um, that, that quote by Oscar Wilde, that, that quip he made that all art is quite useless, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But art, if we consider that concept in the, concept, in the context of liberal learning, right? It makes me wonder if, if friendship is, is, in, is, is an art, even a liberal art. Hmm. something we necessarily engage by virtue of being human, hmm. right? And therefore essential to our own self-understanding. Hmm. And, and, and while you can, you know, read reflections and, and, you know, some deep inquiry on the nature of friendship, you know, from the pre-Socratics to, to the present, it's not really something that I, I find people have encountered as a subject to be studied, right? Or something to really engage or to perfect. I mean, how, much, how many public conversations or even personal conversations have you really had about how to be a true friend or what, what true friendship really is? Hmm. And, and so I'm just throwing it out there to, to the group. Um, what, what would it mean for us to consider uh, friendship as an art? Hmm. Mm. I, I'd love to take a crack at, at that one, gentlemen. If you. Taylor made it for you, Lexi. Go ahead. <laughs> 
Yes, thank you. Thank you, Albert, for that question. I'm, I'm riveted reflecting about the re reflecting on the relationship between friendship and, and art or the liberal arts as, as, as you talked about. Um, and I think that they're inextricably bound because as a species, we are defined by two competing aspects of our nature. We are biologically driven to, to self-preserve, like we have this innate self-interest, yet we are also profoundly social and we have a drive to build community and be with others. And those two things are intention, um, this, this, this self-interested aspect of our nature and the social aspect of our nature. And this is how I talk about and define civility, but it's the pro but it's also like the civilizing process. It's it's the process of subjugating the selfish for the social aspects of our nature to flourish, and for us to not just survive, but to thrive as as a species and and, and in community. And this is directly linked to the liberal arts tradition because um, you'd love. Three newsletters ago, um, Albert on Paideia, this this Greek concept of culture, um, and and the Roman manifestation of that being humanitas, which the Renaissance humanists co-opted and and um, actually used the phrase like it was their concept of civility, like this is how this is how we we socialize. We're going to use the the classics. We're going to use great literature, wisdom literature, and we're going to um, use it for character formation. We're going to teach use it to orient our loves and teach students to what they ought to love and they should love other human beings and they should they should avoid vice and and that's that's a, a conception of education and it's a tradition that I'm incredibly excited and, and passionate about but it's one that we've largely lost today other than a few bastions uh, in America and around the world civic renaissance is one of them so I hope all of you on this call will uh, will consider subscribing uh, where where we conceive of education as 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 soul craft and as as liberal in the sense of of an education that makes us free and fit for self governance in a democracy. Not liberal as in like conservative and liberal, but liberal in the freedom sense. Um, so I love that question, Albert, and I really appreciate you being here tonight. Hmm. Yeah, indeed, you're right, Albert. It is. Uh, I had this. I had that thought too. Friendship is a subject that we don't often have opportunity to engage uh, analytically. And you know, I, I did ask myself uh, earlier today and yesterday, or just in the lead up to this, you know, uh, am I a good friend? You know, what, what does it mean mm. to be a good friend? And I, I think that I am, um, I hope that I am, but it did occur to me that it's not something to take for granted because that, that has to be more than just what I would like to think about myself. There has to be an art and a discipline to that too, I think, the mm. practice of friendship. And so thank you uh, for, for, uh, for loaning us your eloquence and uh, <laughs> major contribution. Pun very much intended. Um, Marlene Johnson, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've been sitting here listening and of course I've come up with many more questions other than this original <laughs> one, but I will keep it concise here. I, what, just to build on actually the first question that Debbie was asking about the dualism, how we can be in this either or, made me think about actually a very dear friend of mine who has always said it's both and. Mm. I love that, it's both and. Mm -hmm. So as I then started to think about friendships that I have, I also thought, remember just this phrase, I think we've all heard it, if you want to have a good Thanksgiving dinner, you don't, don't talk about politics or religion. You know, keep it out of the conversation. And I thought, you know, that could be sage advice. I know here at Braver Angels, our whole point is to be able to talk about it. But then I started thinking about that both and. So how can we incorporate both and into healing our friendships? And by that, I mean, there may be times when setting boundaries mm -hmm. is one of the things you need to do. And it's just because we just aren't gonna go there. That's interesting, but we won't go there. But then at other times, embracing curiosity. I really think curiosity is key. 
In other words, suspending judgment. And this came up when someone was saying, I think it was, um, actually it was you, John, about the friend who was upset that the brother-in-law voted for Trump. And so immediately you think, I mean, if someone who was a blue would think, oh, Trump, they voted for him. That means they are X, 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 X. What if the person was not, did not, it did not fall into that little box. And so by suspending judgment, what if you just asked, well, that is, can you tell me why you voted? What, what was it about Trump that you liked or that you voted for? And then you come to understand that there may have been reasons mm -hmm. that were not part of what you thought were the reasons this person voted. Maybe you might, or may, maybe you didn't agree with them. This, that's the thing about suspending judgment and listening and curiosity is that you might learn something. It doesn't mean that you have to agree with it. Mm -hmm. Maybe you still think, well, I, I wouldn't have voted for Trump for those reasons either. But boy, now I understand better who you are and you're not in that original box. Mm -hmm. So I just think there's a place for both that well, there's always a place for suspending judgment, but when you look at friendship, when can you embrace curiosity and take it a step further to better understand? And when will you need to like just set the boundary and not go there? Mm. I think it's a delicate balance, this both and. Mm. So if you could, I, that's I'm talking longer than I intended, but that's my question. How do we embrace both and in mm. order to move forward? with our friendships. Thank you, Marlene. I think this might be a good point to bring the professor back into the- uh... Well, let me just say Marlene answered her own question. I don't really have much more to say than, than what you said, Marlene. You, you, you answered your own question. It's both and. It's both connection and boundaries. And I was thinking about there's a season for everything. There's a time for everything. There's a time for engaging with curiosity. There's a time for speaking with passion. There's a time for listening. There's a time for not engaging. And that's why Thanksgiving dinner, the meal itself is probably not the time for political conversation, but doing the dishes afterwards. Um, so I think you answered your own question. It was, it was lovely. Lexi, I know you've thought a fair amount about uh, curiosity. Is there anything you want to say on that point? Um, I love Mar Marlena. It sounds like she was on our um, Brave Angels uh, webinar last month on curiosity because she she said it all. Like how how to stay curious. Like curiosity curiosity is iterative. Like the more you learn, the more you know, the more wonder you have around about the world around you, about the people around you, and um, and so. I, I I love that question, and I love yeah, <laughs> I love your I love your answers too, Marlene. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much, Marlene. Um, and so let's go next now to uh, Gavin. Gavin, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, join the conversation. Thank you very much. I appreciate this. This is my first opportunity to get into talk to Brave Rangers. I've been a member now for a little while, but this is exciting. Um, I have a 50,000 foot view question regarding uh, collectivist versus individualistic cultures. Has America kind of become a hyper individualistic culture. And by that, I mean, there's a tendency for individuals to feel like people are more likely out to get them than open to understand them. So my question is, what might we have to learn from other cultures? And I ask this fully recognizing that there are many different cultures right here in the US. So it's not necessarily a political boundaries question. Hmm. Hmm. Um. When Alexis de Tocqueville came to America in the 1840s from France, he made the same observation uh, that you did, Gavin, that we're incredibly individualistic, which is why he was fascinated by our civic associations, our, so our voluntary associational life where Americans just got together and did things and fixed things. And this is a tradition that America has really adopted as a, as a national identity. We have a really rich history of national service. And um, I mean, uh, Braver Angels itself is a manifestation of this rich tradition. People like uh, Dr. Doherty and David Blankenhorn uh, getting together and saying, you know, there's a problem in our country. We're going to fix it. We're not going to wait for the government to do it. We're going to do what we can uh, to, to, make, to make a difference. And Tocqueville noted that these civic associations, 
the tradition that we're a part of right here was a powerful, the powerful antidote to the individualistic impulse that Tocqueville noted, you know, near, near the close to the beginning of our country. And that relates to our conversation on friendship tonight, because, you know, while we can't physically be together right now necessarily yet, um, you know, just, just seeing, seeing how we choose to invest our time, how we choose to, um, foster and build our relationships and how those relationships connect us to our broader community and mesh us in our, in our, our neighborhoods and, and city civic life. That is, is, a, is, a, is a powerful um, part of, of, of the antidote to, you, rightly, you noted, um, a, a potentially very problematic excess towards individualism. Thank you. I'm glad we got to talk for Lynn. Uh, <laughs> you know, we should not ever go too long in our conversations without getting to talk on. So appreciate that, Lexi. And I'll just add something, uh, Gavin. It's a, it's a, a very important question. It's really kind of the, the 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 kind of key question I'm asking about my own profession of psychotherapy, which I think has gotten incredibly individualistic. I just want to say one, perhaps provocative thing, that I think instead of turning all of our minority groups into victim groups, we should be thinking about what many of our minority groups could teach the rest of the country about a communal collectivist approach. Mm -hmm. African-Americans in general are more collectivist. Uh, Asian-Americans are, I don't mean to engage in stereotypes, but these are accurate generalization, Latino folks. Um, um, and um, what we do is we, we only emphasize uh, how groups have been screwed over, which is true. And we don't emphasize what what the what the, um, the European American individualist tradition needs to learn from the more communal traditions in our midst, hmm. because I think this is important for our making it as a country. So, just a brief observation. That's amazing. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your responses. Yeah, yeah, that was a fascinating exchange. Okay, excellent, man. I wish we could linger on some of these points longer, but they're more good ones to come, and we still have uh, we still have a few minutes to go. Uh, let's go next then uh, to Aaron Tao. Aaron, go ahead, uh, unmute yourself. Hi, Aaron. Welcome. Hey, Lexi. Good, good to hear from you. Yeah. Um, at the beginning, you um, you mentioned the friendship between John Adams and Thomas Je Jefferson, and um, I was wondering that if, if it, do you th really think there was a golden age of where 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 discourse was civil and people looked beyond politics and maintained their friendships because even then the politics back then was really rancorous as you as you pointed out yourself so was there really a golden age either here in this country or elsewhere that's a great question was there a golden age of, of civil discourse or friendship ever in human history <laughs> and i would say no because and 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 i and i reject characterizations um, of either people now looking back on a golden age then, um, or um, it, it, because that doesn't, it, it's, it's, it's harder to see. Uh, we, we live in the moment now, and, and this is what we're most, you know, riveted by, engaged by, stimulated by, and, and it's easy to kind of emphasize the good things of past eras and focus on the negative aspects of our own moment. But again, I'll come back to this time and time again, human nature doesn't change. We have the these equally powerful facets of our nature um, towards preserving ourselves and, and perpetuating our own interests, our selfishness, but also our social sociability. And, and those, those two aspects of our nature have always been with us across time, across place. And of course, there are, there are certain institutional arrangements that can um, mitigate the, the impacts of, of human selfishness. For example, we, we live in a, in a repu Republican democracy that has the rule of law and, and, and um, government transparency and where we as voters keep, um, keep the potential selfishness of our uh, public leaders in check. Like th these are institutional arrangements that are in place to kind of mitigate the costs of our selfishness. Um, but that doesn't, no, no institutional arrangement, no set of norms, no culture, um, no social engineering will ever fully eradicate 
um, eradicate that, uh, that th those aspects that are the negative aspects of our nature. So um, thanks for that question. It's a really, it's a really powerful one. I mean, that that's like, even as we, we've talked a lot about Robert Putnam um, this evening, where it, people have often characterized him as looking back on a golden age of the 1960s, um, when uh, there, there are problems with looking at the 60s as, as a paragon of, of something we would want to look back to. I mean, the, the civil rights era, the, the era, of, era of protest and racial injustice was uh, very much alive and well then. Um, so, so, so thank you for that question. Dualism, uh, dualism all the way through. <laughs> <laughs> My hope is always that the golden age is the age yet to come. So we have something, right. something to look forward to. Um, okay, let's go next to uh, Stephen Humphreys. I think that says Humphreys. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Hi, it's uh, great to see you, Lexi and John and Bill, after following me on Twitter. Hi. And a shout out <laughs> to my friend Bert. Hello, Bert. Um, yeah, more than ever, Americans are living in, in states, cities, and neighborhoods that reflect their own political identities. People are self-selecting where to live. They're finding their tribes. And so often Americans seldom count, encounter people of other persuasions because they just don't live in the same areas anymore. Um, and that, that means that many people imagine the other through stereotypes, through media depictions, through, uh, through social media interactions, which aren't very helpful. Mm. And so I'm wondering, given that there is that physical and geographic divide, are there ways to transcend that uh, through civil society solutions? Mm. I think, John, you should take that one, John. It's a hard one. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, obviously, uh, Stephen, you know, there is, um, I mean, you know, just the, the function of Braver Angels conspicuously is to seek to accomplish precisely, precisely that, really, you know. One interesting um, uh, fact about the need to adapt to the changing landscape of interaction that came with um, the advent of the pandemic and the and the lockdown that followed was the fact that we had to do more of this sort of thing, you know, engaging the digital medium, engaging engaging Zoom because that's just where everybody was. But the the benefit of that is that it's allowed us to connect people from across geographical differences um, in a way that's expanded uh, our reach and our capacity to uh, build bridges between Americans who uh, otherwise have sorted themselves into communities on the basis of uh, seeking um, culturally, socially, and perhaps ideologically uh, friendlier environments. And so, um, you know, we're not the only ones, but we're certainly a, a, an example of an organization that seeks to uh, address that manifestation of the division along with others. I think, though, that your point speaks to the fact that in so much of our communal, certainly geographic, as you mentioned, and just general associational life, we're sorting in all sorts of ways uh, so as to allow us, perhaps on the positive end, to connect with people who think like we do, but perhaps also on the negative end, and, it, it, and who knows you know, which of these factors is more prominent in this, but on the negative end, I think there, there's some fear that drives that sorting. So in other words, it's not just a positive desire to be mm -hmm. among people who's politics you may agree with, it, it may be a negative desire to get away from people who you are afraid or maybe have already experienced some ostracization from, some demonization from, because I mean, the basis for our conversation here today and all of our work really is the larger, the sort of macro trend in American society towards normalizing that sort of ostracization and that, that, that demonization, right? And so I think that this therefore becomes very much a multi-pronged effort, uh, trying to figure out ways in which the American people can reconnect with each other across all of the different silos we're in, geographic, digital, um, et cetera. And I think that civil society, civil society is able to 
give us vehicles and has given us vehicles that provide structures for us to engage one another beyond our political differences. I mean, they don't, I don't think that they ask you if you're a Republican or a Democrat, if you're joining the Rotary Club or the Exchange Club, or if you're going to, you know, be a part of, uh, you know, local, uh, local baseball team or something like that. Um, the question, though, in part is whether or not we can cultivate norms of discourse, norms of empathy and, and engagement that are resilient to the creeping, uh, maybe not creeping, maybe you know, very conspicuous in many cases, um, prevailing norms of social demonization that in certain respects are becoming more and more accepted as features of our institutional life in America, on college campuses, in certain respects, in the workplace, certainly within you know political you know environments, um, and I think that our ability to do that, our ability to seed more empathetic sort of practices of discourse and collaboration and community building has itself to do with our ability to tell a story to the American people and amongst ourselves about who we are in a way that goes beyond, that transcends, you know, our narrower identities as Democrats or Republicans um, or whatever else the case may be. So I think that there's a way in which the structure of civil society organizations can provide the bridges that you're talking about, but I think it has to be reinforced by a larger story that we can tell each other in American life and that we have to find ways to amplify that begins to dislodge the partisan narratives that are so invested in pitting us against each other for the narrower institute for the narrower interests of some of the powers that be but at the expense of our ability to maintain community relationship and friendship with each other so i think that's about the best i can do in in response to that that question which is a good one um okay excellent well let us continue on um Mark Wong. Mr. Wong, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and, and jump in. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, what Stephen just said, um, we actually are different from our own family members, uh, but we learn to get along. So if we can learn to get along better with our own family members, then we can actually make a lot of headway into that. Now, back to my original, what I wanted to say, um, we know how to get along on the roads. We can learn how to get along in society. <laughs> everyone to listen instead of yield, check biases instead of blind spots, and reject ideological rage instead of road rage. So in terms of what Bill says, the choir, we are, in terms of a safe driving culture, we're all part of that choir already. We already mm -hmm. do that. In terms of what um, uh, Albert was saying, uh, we actually don't have to be friends to uh, adhere to a safe driving culture. But I do actually believe that we can do more, solve more problems if we can get to that friendship level, uh, get go beyond. Um, and uh, so my question is, uh, do you think it's gonna take something as big as safe driving to actually make the kind of change to, I mean, we don't have a golden age of driving and we'll never get there, but uh, <laughs> we can actually accomplish a lot. And will we need something as big as safe driving to actually change society on that level? What do you guys think? Hmm. Uh, well, that's a, that's, that's a great analogy, isn't it? I love it. Um, yeah. Well, Lexi, Bill, do either of you want to uh, speak to that? Um, I'm happy to take a, take a swing at it myself. Go ahead, Bill, or, or John. Oh, John, go for it. Go for two for two here, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that what I would just uh, say, Mark, is that, yeah, I mean, so, you know, there are countries in the world, as I understand it, where um, you have, you know, traffic signs, you have, you know, um, roads and, and street names and, and rules on the books, but uh, nobody follows them. <laughs> and uh, those are dangerous places uh, to drive in. I remember uh, Trevor Noah, the, you know, comedian uh, host, the, host the Daily Show, he's from South Africa. And I remember he, he quipped something along the lines of, we have street lights in South Africa, but it's like somebody went to America and saw them and saw, thought that they looked cool, but didn't know what they were for and just came back and say, hey, Americans decorate their streets this way. Let's put these <laughs> lights up and then we can just drive right past them. Um, so this is why um, the discipline of civic friendship um you know we've 
talked a bit here about the uh, idea of there being a, an art uh, to, to friendship, as Albert mentioned. And so, so too, I think there must be an art to civic friendship and certainly best practices in terms of how we conduct ourselves in a democracy. I think that, you know, like, uh, like driving, it is important for us to, one, uh, cultivate um, cultivate practices and habits in accordance with structures and rules. You know, not not necessarily you know ironclad you know um, sort sorts of you know legal strictures like you have to enforce with driving, but nevertheless to have recognizable customs and norms that we in some sense train ourselves in and train each other in. Um, even if so much of that education is done by example, though, of course, there's so much of it to be done by direct instruction, and we do much of that work uh, here at Braver Angels, uh, taking, taking after the, the, the lead set by, uh, by Bill and his, and his designs. Um, there has to be that um, in just the way that there have to be uh, rules of the road, but we also have to be invested in those norms. We have to be invested in those customs. We have to be committed uh, to elevating our, our culture of, of discourse, of, of community. Uh, and, and that is to say that we need to be invested in one another and see it as a part of our positive ab obligation to each other, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to uh, commit ourselves to norms of civic decency um, and, to, um, uh, and, and, and to live by them. You know, mm -hmm. so um, yeah, I think that I think that the analogy um, um, gets us a pretty good good way down the road. If you if you think can, I add one thing. That's John? excellent. Thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so that's a really really fun analogy. I love. I wrote down, Mark, what you said. Don't have to be friends with the people we drive with on this on the road. I think that's really interesting. I'm gonna I'm gonna think about that for a little bit. So, um, speaking of 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 norms, I'm writing a book on. On, on civility and, and the norms of a democracy. And one core part of my argument is that there's an important difference between civility and politeness. Civility is a fundamental disposition um, towards others, towards respecting the dignity and the humanity of others. Politeness is a technique. It's manners, it's convention. And I think that's, that's, that's an important distinction that, that I'm, I'm working out in my, in my project, in my book, and it relates to your question mark um, because I've been thinking a lot about the relationship um, between morality and convention. And when I think it's really easy for us to, to see difference, differences in convention, differences in taste, differences in people's preferences and use it as an excuse to, to think that we're better than others and, and, to, and to kind of see taste and convention and, and use them as proxies for moral differences and moral issues when that's not the case. And so part of my project is to, is to, is to make that point, you know, that um, and I think that's an important reminder now, especially when we're in a moment um, where we're hungry for friendship, hungry for community. And I think that as humans, we have like a, I don't know, the, the Bill, the psychologist can tell us why it is that we are our, our like own worst enemies and like self-sabotage ourselves so many times. Like we want friends, but we, we self-sabotage and we, 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 we erect um, unnecessary barriers to friendship by like nitpicking and, and saying, oh, well, this person, you know, used their fork wrong. So I'm not gonna, you know, see them again. And like, I, I want to take, um, take the conversation on civility out of that realm of convention alone and out of taste alone and put it more squarely in the realm of, of the friendship and community necessary to sustain our free, our free and flourishing democratic way of life. Um, so, and, and really quickly, I know we have to end soon. And, and, and one thing I wanted to mention was um, to encourage all of you that as we, as we enter in this post, this post pandemic era, like, Make make you know make those bids of friendship. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be awkward, but it's it's worth the risk. And and we're going and and hope that other people have grace for us, and in turn like have grace for the people that we encounter that you know are going to say weird things that they only said to their cat <laughs> for the last year of their life. And it's just going to take it's just going to take some time. So sociability it is a habit, and it is um, something that 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 we're out of, we're out of the practice. And um, before this clause, telling Bill there was a 
a paper I was reading, there was a summary of it in that Los Angeles uh, review of books, I think, called The Surprising Power of Social Outreach. Um, we fear social rejection more than almost anything. Um, our brains interpret social rejection as tantamount to pain. Like we were terrified of social rejection, rejection and, and you know, being, um, being cast out from, from the tribe. Um, but we, uh, people are much more receptive to bids of affection and bids for community than we realize. That's what this paper was, was unpacking. And so even though we're terrified of it, people, people receive it far more, far better than we think. And, and we should do it for the sake of our, our personal happiness, for the sake of our, our democracy, and for the sake of a, a happier and more flourishing post-pandemic era grounded in empathy and compassion that I think that we're all ready for after a very fraught and divided time. So. Um, um, it's been a real privilege, privilege to be with you all, and I've loved every second of this evening and, and loved getting to know all of you. Thank you for the thoughtful questions. Mm, indeed. Well, I know that we're down to our closing minutes. Luke, if we move quickly, do you think we can squeeze in uh, maybe two more or? Um... I think so, as long as, we are, as long as you're ready to give the uh, closing statements by about 9.57 or so. Okay, gotcha. Well, well, we'll make sure you folks get to bed more or less on time. Um, so yeah, uh, let's try and get a couple more if we can, but I'm going to have to ask that folks uh, make their make these closing questions uh, as concise as you can get them. Colette Harrison, uh, let's go ahead and uh, unmute and uh, let us know what's on your mind. Thank you. I don't know that I have as much a question as a comment um, that it seems to me that this idea of friendships and what we define as friendships has become increasingly prevalent and um, I had participated in a, um, an intimate conversations about race program not too long ago. And that was one of the key questions that came up. How do we create friendships, genuine friendships, instead of the superficial smiling at each other in, in cocktail party type friendships mm -hmm. um, between people and, and develop the trust that it takes for those friendships to cre be created. The other thought I had also was that um, I often encounter people, you know, when I talk about joining the choir um, and they say, but I can't sing. <laughs> I don't know how to sing. I don't, I, I don't want to learn how to sing. So, it, it, you know, it becomes a challenge in that respect. And um, although I keep preaching to other people in different groups that I'm in and, and talking about this group, or braver angels in general, and I'm really happy that one of my social justice group people is here tonight. Yay! Um, yeah. So, and um, you know, the other thing is that I've been doing this whole thing about moving from either or to both and for a long time, and uh, facilitate some training and some groups about learning how to respond rather than react. Mm. Yeah. which is something we've been talking about tonight. Um, and I found myself reacting to someone who had attended a Braver Angels group and said, oh, this will never work. I don't know why I bothered to come. And I was so frustrated. I, I, you know, I wanted to shake that person and say, obviously you weren't listening. So um, I know I still have a ways to go, but um, the more we talk about these things, the more we find ways to... Um, share them with others and I took copious notes and I'm going to use them in our social justice group tomorrow. Thank you. Hey. Indeed. Well, thank you. So, uh, Colette, to let that so if I could get in on this, uh, Colette, the, the choir is a talking choir. It's a speaking choir, not a singing choir. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> and and I, you know, I thought I had retired from my professional life. And what I realized is that instead of being a paid trauma therapist, I'm now um, a recovering from trauma advocate there we go there we go so <laughs> yeah. if everybody can speak it's a speaking choir the other thing is it gives me a chance <clears throat> to emphasize i, I haven't uh, something i haven't emphasized so far that this idea of civic friendship is uh, working together to to repair the world to build to build a world to build a community uh, and through that, discovering one another's uniqueness and coming to value each other uh, deeply, which is different from starting off because we resonate with each other and we're sort of into the natural, I think this is cool. Um, uh, and so a number of the friendships that I formed uh, through Braver Angels 
are with people who I never would have become friends with outside of this because mm -hmm. we have a mission. We have a mission and we have to work together and we have to work through conflict. We have to work across differences together to save our country, if you will. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and so that's the collective friendship. And, and we in Braver Angels, we have our internal conflicts. We have our internal crises. You should see what happened in our organization after January 6th. And, um, and, um, and could our paradigm hold? Um, but the, the, the friendships that have formed mm. uh, with Braver Angels um, in, in, the, the, in the sort of crucible of difference uh, trying to improve our country, that civic friendship, and there are powerful bonds there that for me are deeply enriching. Mm. Mm, indeed. Yes. And you do not need to be able to carry a tune in order to join our choir. If you did, there's no way that Bill would be a part of it. So <laughs> feel, free to, feel free to pass that. <laughs> okay, excellent. Uh, Rena Baker, if you can uh, make it uh, quick. Uh, just in the interest of time, I'd love for you to ask your question. It's kind of answer to. Arena, you, you're, you are muted. An answer to the question, is there a golden age? And the golden age is early childhood. <laughs> Children don't see differences until they're taught to. Mm -hmm. And they are much more tolerant. And I think we have a lot to learn from uh, that developmental stage. Mm -hmm. um, and to empathy, which has been mentioned several times, which is the ability to see another person's view and not necessarily accept it, but at least listen and be attentive. That's a talk. You can teach that to people, even st stubborn adults, if they're willing to learn empathy, it's teachable. Mm -hmm. And so that's my hope. And, and I think your forum it actually fits into that. Mm -hmm. it, it's just uh, exactly what we have lost when we're taught to have certain biases. And so uh, good for all of you for setting this up. And I see a lot of hope in the children, much like Jane Goodall kind of gave up on the adults in her, <laughs> her you know, her, 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 her efforts to change attitude toward the animal kingdom. So she, she developed an organization for children called Roots and Wings. And I see, you know, there's, there's hope in our, our very young people, but there's hope in, in the adults that you all have invited into. So thank you and um, learn from our little ones. <laughs> thank you, Rena. And I'll take that as a closing uh, comment from yourself. Uh, let's see if we can just squeeze in. Uh, God, there's only two of you left with your hands up. Jeez, oh. I'd really like to get, to get to both of you, but it's just gonna have to be just very quickly. Uh, I see Foster Goodwill, if you could, if you can uh, package it in about 30 to 45 seconds, I'd really appreciate it. Okay. Um, you, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if it's uh, hopeless to try and do that or not, but uh, I'll just give it, have it go at it. Uh, and that is, uh, I, I believe that uh, human nature is uh, governed a lot by our egos and, and a sense of separation from each other. And uh, uh, in, in our bitter angels or our higher side, our more spiritual side is, Motiv motivated more towards love and inclusion and uh, i think that hours that be in this world are working uh, are using the ego's dark side uh, to keep us separated from each other so that we can't <clears throat> we can't uh, find uh, so that we can't ever get get at equality and uh, anyway uh, i'm sorry that's not much of a question but anyway it's a beautiful it's a beautiful comment thank it's beautiful you. and perfect way to close us thank you so much for that well, it's, it's a perennial struggle, isn't it, um, between the selfish and the selfless aspects of our nature. So, no, that's a good contribution. And uh, actually, there, there's just one hand left. Chuck, do you think that you can uh, wrap us up in about 30 seconds or so? And if it's a question, happy to try and offer a quick response. I will, I will give it my best shot. Um, this goes back. I can't remember who, who put this thought into my head, but as someone who is a... Um, a definite introvert 
I don't know how that aspect of our personalities plays into some of this stuff or if it does and how it, you know, is part of the idea of civic friendship and all of that. But certainly I'm one of those who can not do without friendship, but it's, it's, it's less important to me and I need that alone time to, you know, sort of decompress and do things. And, I, and I, again, this may not even fit in, so there may not be an, an answer within the, within the context of this that, that is uh, worth spending any time on. But that was, that was what I was thinking about based on someone's earlier comment. So I'll do 30 oh, seconds on that as the psychologist here. Um, it's the, it's um, like with their own childhood, as somebody said, the big thing with kids is not how many friends they have, whether they have one. Hmm. The, the big difference for kids is zero friends or one friend. Okay. Um, and so uh, extroverts are going to maybe have a bunch, uh, introverts fewer, it's the quality, it's the depth. And I would also add that there are ways to develop friends just by working together and stuff where you don't have to, you know, you don't have to be extroverted and you know, and, and, and love to tell stories about yourself to work alongside somebody and develop bonds of friendship. Mm -hmm. There you go. Chuck, you're speaking for, uh, for Mrs. Wood. Uh, my wife is very uh, similar to you in the way she described, I asked her this question about friendship. And uh, I told her that some people say that a necessary part of friendship is consistency. I said that earlier, doing things together, right. you know, keeping up the cadence. And she said, no, she said, that's not so important to me. She said, uh, consistency may be in the early stages of a friendship to form the bond. But if I haven't talked to you for a year or two and you were my friend then, you're still my friend now, as long as I know that you're going to be there for me when it counts and I'll be there for you. So mm. that might be something to tie on to your point. Folks, we are at a close here. I think that this has been a great event. And I just want to go ahead and close this out by thanking all of you for participating in what really has been a rich and I think deeply edifying conversation. So many of you are members of Braver Angels, but if you are not, we would love to have you on board with us and participating with us as a member and potentially as a volunteer. You can do that by following the link in the chat uh, to our website at braverangels.org. We also want folks to support and to check out Civic Renaissance, founded by Alexandra Hudson, who you've heard from tonight, uh, and to be on the lookout for her book when it comes out, by the way. Um, and so you'll be hearing about that, uh, about that uh, as well. So Civic Renaissance, Braver Angels, we hope that folks can uh, keep up with uh, our work and stay involved. Uh, we are building a house united, and we are very grateful for all of your participation here tonight. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.